All right, so we're into the next session for today and uh, we are moving on to Jude. Uh, thank you, Dave, for reading that entire passage. It's really interesting. Um, and at the same time, uh, it is a common theme that we have seen so far. Apostle John wrote, uh, wrote about apostasy. Um, Apostle Peter wrote about apostasy. Now we have Jude. Who is also writing about apostasy apostasy is basically um going away from god you know go uh, it is uh not holding on to the truth but deception and moving away from god to the extent of falling away so that is apostasy uh, and it seems like in the early church the church was growing we saw that in the book of acts and uh you know, people were people were coming to know the Lord, but then there was this whole thing about discipleship and maturing in God as well. So seems like some people were growing in God, but some people went away with their own um, interpretation of the scriptures and doing their own thing uh, with the wrong attitudes. Uh, and so even when Paul talks about um, uh, the you know the church. In uh, uh, Acts 20, uh, I think he's encouraging the um, efficient leaders. He tells them you know, there are going to be wolves that will come uh, among you. So please be careful because wrong teaching is very dangerous. You know, wrong teaching is very, very dangerous. We should never listen to wrong teaching. Um, and at the same time, if people are being taught wrong things as leaders, we have to uh, warn them. Okay, or uh, we we've, we've seen you know different things that should be done when there is wrong teaching. We preach the truth clearly to God's people. Then God's people are able to tell that hey, this is the truth and this is the deceptive teaching. So, uh, so even Paul he warned that there will be such in the church who themselves will go astray they will take other people also with them so this is a this is a challenge this was a challenge in the first century church and it continues to be a challenge today and somehow you know there is a mention even when paul writes to timothy he says in the last days or the closer we come to the return of Jesus, we will observe that there are a lot of false teachers, false teachings, and uh, they call it Jesus and Christ, but, you know, going away from the Lord. So be very, very careful. So even Jude, he is uh, addressing this issue of apostasy. So what does Jude say? Let's go to uh, the book of Jude. So a few things for us to understand. This book was also written around the same time when Peter wrote. So you could, uh, you could, you know, somewhere uh, between 60 to uh, 70 AD is when the book of Jude was written. Who is Jude? You know, Jude, the original name is Judas. There are uh, many different you know, Judas is in the New Testament. Um, but because Judas Iscariot had a bad testimony, he went away from the Lord. Uh, it is likely that the, uh, the, the, his, you know, the Bible scholars like who've put all this together, they've somehow uh, avoided that name Judas. Instead of that, they've shortened it and called it Jude. Okay. But the original name is Judas. And this <laughs> Jude, is a half brother of Jesus. Jesus had uh, four uh, half brothers and, and sisters. So Jude is one of the half brothers uh, and also James. So the next uh, book which we are going to study, that was also written by the half brother of Jesus. So it's, you know, you can think of it like a Jewish family. In a Jewish family, people traditionally are very close-knit. Uh, they, they grow up with a strong sense of uh, kinship so jude would have been very close to jesus similarly james also he too would have been very close to jesus but we see in the gospels that uh, the his brothers did not believe him okay so uh, both jude and james they were unbelievers they did not believe in jesus when jesus was alive it was only after the resurrection of jesus that they joined the group 
they would have probably been uh, in that uh, 120 people in the upper room so uh, they after the resurrection they understood that this brother who was with us he was not just a human being but he was the son of god so uh, you know they gave their lives to him to such an extent that you know you see even james like about james you uh, when you study his life he was martyred he was killed for the sake of his faith uh, but that is the extent of the commitment so both of these people jude and james they became uh, believers in the lord jesus christ uh, and they uh, became leaders in the early church so no wonder you have an epistle from uh, jude which is being written to god's people okay let's see now you know uh, what he has in there All right. Mm, yes. Yes. So he starts off by saying, Jude, a born servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So that don't you think that is uh, so different? He could have said, I'm a brother of Jesus. I, if my brothers and sisters are there, I'll just say, hey, I, I am the sister of this person. But Jude recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. So he gives him that due respect and calls himself, I am a born servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also he says, brother of James. Okay. Yeah, excuse me. Then he addresses the people of God. And he says, those who are called, sanctified, excuse me, class, and preserved in Jesus Christ. So this is a common way of addressing the believers by um, speaking of what has happened in Christ Jesus. So called, sanctified, preserved. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I, I think I don't have to explain that we have studied all these terms um, in the in Christ course. Now, he greets the people. He says, mercy, peace, um, and love be multiplied. And then the next two verses here, he is encouraging the believers to contend for the faith. So he says, concerning our common salvation. So what is common salvation? No, he looks at the community as a whole and says that everybody has been born again. So what is that? A common redemption. Individually, people have been redeemed, but the community has been redeemed by Christ. So that is why he uses the term common salvation. Um, and then uh, in the uh, end of verse 3, he says, contend earnestly for the faith. So he's saying that as a believing community, we have to protect the faith. You know, what is content? Content is when we are fighting uh, for something. You know, we contend for our rights as the citizens of the country. You know, I should be given the voting rights. So what, what is happening? Uh, you know, year after year, there are people, they are fighting and saying, this right belongs to us, give it to us, give it to us, till you get it. So that is contending. So he's saying that, I explained to us that there could have been uh, many people within the congregation who were coming up with wrong teachings and wrong uh, guidance. Uh, so he's saying, you are a believing community. How is it that you can allow such uh, wrong things to happen within you? You have to put up a fight or contend, he says, earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. So you see the integrity of what we have received. And I have spoken about this a couple of times uh, to your class. 
what we have received the true the doctrine which we have received we should not let that be mixed up okay uh, that's where the danger lies so preserve what you have learned so far then he says certain men have crept unnoticed again you you realize it's a very secretive way of entering the community of god where uh, you know as if uh, uh, the right things are being taught these these uh, uh, apostates you know they come and they pretend they pretend that you are going to be benefited by these teachings but ultimately there is a great loss by listening to them so he says they have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation so you see what is the end of such people not honor because the the new testament says those of those who serve well uh, they gain for themselves a good standing or honor honor comes when a uh, right word of god is taught but when deception is propagated the end result is condemnation okay or shame shame will come upon such people he also describes them as ungodly men who turn the grace of our god into lewdness now lewdness is sin so it seems like there are people in the church at that time or the congregation who say that you know now we are not under the uh, old covenant we are under grace uh, so it's okay you know god is a very gracious god he is a very kind god he will forgive you uh, and he says they go to the extreme to talk about the grace of god in such a way that it is promoting sinfulness lewdness is sin okay and even sin which has to do with sexual immorality and so when there are wrong teachers and teachings what does it promote it promotes wrong believing it promotes wrong lifestyle wrong behavior and therefore the result which is condemnation and dishonor so he's saying they even turn the grace of god into lewdness how how can you you know even think about that god's grace what does it do it's god's kindness it leads us to repentance and it makes us holier but the false apostles and teachers they are preaching the grace but moving people into deeper and deeper sin and he also says to deny the only lord so by their teaching people are also denying you know, the real jesus the real messiah god our lord jesus christ so he says okay i want to remind you brethren like be careful of such people so now he brings up some examples so from verse 5 to verse uh, 7 he has three examples there he says one is the people who came out of the land of egypt uh, they did not believe so he's talking about the unbelieving israelites then second group is he says angels who did not keep their proper domain uh now they are in chains third category he says sodom and gomorrah the remember the old cities that abraham interceded for sodom and gomorrah similarly because of their sexual immorality okay um they also are condemned so he brings up the examples of these three categories of you know uh um uh, not people people and angels and he says we have to take a lesson from the attitude so what was the attitude of the israelites they were unbelieving what was the attitude of these angels it says they did not keep their proper domain um so what did they try to do they tried to uh take more power than what was already given to them we understand right that satan lucifer and one third of the angels they rebelled against god and what god told them to do they were trying to look for something else they were trying to look for their own greatness so they behaved with arrogance first is unbelief second is arrogance they were arrogant so now what is the result of that they are in everlasting chains or god has punished them so there are that set of angels not 
all of them are in chains but you have some of them in chains and you know some uh, demons are there you know in the world they are uh, moving around so that is what we have seen and the third category is sodom and gomorrah okay what was the problem with sodom and gomorrah you know, they were uh, all about their fleshly desires so they went for sexual immorality okay and uh, uh, um, all these people therefore they will suffer vengeance of eternal fire so there's unbelief there is uh, uh, arrogance there is uh, fleshly lusting these things are not good among god's people and especially he is talking about those who are bringing in such teaching so leaders leaders apostate leaders um, false teachers false apostles and people like that now he moves forward let's look at um, verses 8 to verse 11 here so now he gives some qualities of uh, uh, such apostates he says they are dreamers dreamers what is dreamers dreamers are like you know they they come up with some new new understanding and new teachings which don't have their root or anchor in the word of god so that's when you have to be very careful you know, there are many such teachings so it'll be something new you've never heard uh, you know enoch how much do we know about enoch in the bible very little no we read about enoch in genesis uh, also in jude there is a mention little something little bit but beyond that we don't read anything much but what do people who are called as dreamers do they might come up with a teaching which says okay the the five key principles of intimacy with god from the life of enoch and then you know there can be something about the life of enoch this and that but how do you verify if Enoch's life was like that only or uh, because it's not there in the Bible. So we can't confirm. So the, we would say speculation. Speculation is we can't confirm. Something is said, but we can't confirm. Or we could even have people, dreamers uh, would be like, okay, I had an encounter with Moses. I met Moses. Moses gave me his staff. And uh, we had, uh, we spoke about uh, the end of the world and Moses told me that I'm going to. It sounds so nice, isn't it? But how can we confirm it? It's so hard to confirm things like this. So he's talking about examples and teachings and philosophies that don't have a solid firm anchor in the word of god he says dreamers because they we don't know maybe they really had an encounter maybe they didn't only the fruit of their uh, life will show that to us for that we have to wait and see but there's no way of confirming so he adds all these qualities and says he look look for these qualities if you see these qualities among the the teachers or the apostles then be very very cautious because we are not sure what they are talking about so he says dreamers defile the flesh defile the flesh is lead into sin reject authority like those angels god told them you stay in your position of authority i gave you authority as an angel you're supposed to serve god but what did they do they wanted greater power so they reject authority speak evil of dignitaries speaking evil of dignitaries is to um, dignitaries is leadership so maybe there were people at that time who were teaching false philosophy they were uh, um, rejecting what the apostles were teaching and and you know they were also speaking evil of the apostles at that time so then he goes on to explain to the people and he says look michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of moses dared not bring against him a reviling accusation but said the lord rebuke you so again you see this incident here we don't know too much about this incident so there are many teachings about the body of moses but there is no proper confirmation from god's word 
okay but what can we take from this one verse keep it simple the only understanding the few things that we can understand here is that michael stayed in the authority which was given to him so michael is a warring angel you see his name whenever there is wars uh, happening so there is a time for some reason there is a war about the body of uh, moses uh, at that time uh, the devil comes to fight with him or satan comes to fight with him so michael can rebuke satan if he wants but it's not in his zone of authority so michael says the lord rebuke you so in this we just understand that michael is staying within his boundaries that's all so we should also stay within our boundaries what has god called us to do just do that don't try to uh, covet covet is i look at somebody they are uh, called into the office of a prophet and i covet it or i i desire it i say i wish i can be that prophet or uh, god you make me that uh, give that position of the apostle to me so but my motivation is not correct so these are the kind of things which are not right okay that brings that makes people move in the wrong direction and that is why jude is saying look at michael he was in his own position and he did not even rebuke satan on his own he knew that only god can rebuke satan so he said the lord rebuke you so stay within your boundaries and then you know he goes on to describe more about these apostate uh, people he says but these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally like brute beasts in these things they corrupt themselves so speaking evil uh and passing judgment not having sufficient understanding these are all features of Uh, false apostles so be careful about such people so and then he again brings a rebuke and condemns he says woe to them or they are condemned for they have gone in the way of cain so what did cain do no cain is uh, an example of unbelief again because you remember cain went and gave god an offering abel gave an offering god was impressed with abel's offering reason faith in hebrews 11 we talked about abel because his offering was made with faith which means the offering of cain was made with unbelief so the jude is warning us and he's saying unbelief is not good stay away from unbelief okay so uh, you learn from the example of cain next he says balaam balaam is there in numbers 22 so what is balaam's example balaam was a prophet a mighty prophet of god uh, but the problem with him is you know the the king at that time told him i will give you money you curse god's people and he was ready to curse god's people for the sake of profit so he was a prophet for profit going after money greed greed is the issue here so be careful because what is it could it is the motivation of these uh, uh, apostate leaders they want money they want to enjoy the pleasures of this life and greed will also lead us away from god so unbelief greed and then he mentions one more name called as cora cora is in number 16 now cora is the person who um resented moses and aaron god gave leadership position to moses and aaron but cora what did he try to do he tried to uh, uh, you know fight what god did and uh, he was speaking ill of moses and aaron god did not like that god was very upset so uh, he you could say he rejected god given authority and that is again something which uh, we we see like the angels who were put in uh, chains remember they went beyond their boundary and they rejected authority so 
in the same way korah also rejected god's authority and god was not at all happy with korah so unbelief greed covetousness um rejecting authority rejecting dignitaries speaking evil of of uh, you know people in leadership all these things are not good qualities and which is what jude is warning the people about and he's saying please be away from such things because it will destroy you and it will destroy others you know who are going to follow this example so he's coming to verse 12 again he's adding little more qualities about these apostate leaders he says these are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear serving only themselves so he's pointing out to their quality of self being selfish being self willed so in leadership i think uh, uh, you people would have studied you know it's a very sacrificial thing when we are leaders uh, because we have to think about the people um see if moses was to think only about himself then how can he lead tens and thousands of people he has to make some sacrifices to be their leader think about jesus jesus died on the cross and now we talk about the glorious church of the lord jesus christ but how did that glorious church happen there was a sacrifice and uh, an example we look at jesus and say oh this is our example the lord jesus christ and we follow him so that is true leadership but what is false leadership selfish self willed so he says you find such people enjoying themselves in your feasts so they just want to have a good time and they're all about themselves serving only themselves so pleasure money riches fame those are the things that interest these false leaders and then he says they are clouds without water what is clouds without water no substance you know when they talk we want to get the word of god from them you know they say okay i am a leader oh great come on share god's word with me build me up impart the anointing of god into my life and then they start sharing there is nothing in it for us to draw closer to god so that is why he says it's a zero clouds without water there's no substance and uh, he says obviously there's no substance uh, gone about uh, about by the winds late autumn trees without fruit similar if right? you expect fruit on the trees uh, like how jesus expected from the fig tree but there was no fruit so similarly you know there is nothing in these leaders um and uh, don't follow them so they he says they are twice dead pulled up by the roots raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever so basically he says there is nothing to learn from such people they are selfish and uh, he says what is their ultimate end basically condemnation or judgment remember we talked so much about judgment in uh, first peter chapter 3 sorry second peter chapter 3 he says it's coming and they will experience that now he says verse 14 he says now enoch you see another mention of the man enoch the seventh from adam prophesied about these men also saying behold the lord comes with Ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So judgment, he says, God is going to come back, and these verses are very encouraging because verses fourteen and fifteen it shows the image of our Lord Jesus as coming back like a warrior king. So far, we've seen him as the meek lamb of God slain on the cross of Calvary. But here is the picture where you see the king, warrior king, coming back. He's coming back with all his people. Okay, and together with his people he is going to judge these ungodly people who are now living for their own pleasure so verse 16 again more features he adds about these people he says they are grumblers complainers walking according to their own lust and they mouth great swelling words 
flattering people to gain advantage. So you notice, I don't think I have to explain. It's explaining itself. These are all ways in which they talk. Verse 17, he says, this is how ungodly people are, but this is what I want you to know, people of God. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that um, there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. So you know, he's saying that many of these people, it's possible that they're not even believers. Okay. So, you know, some are the ones who were uh, believers and they went away because they did not take God's word seriously. But he also says there are some who were never believers in the first place. And they were, they don't have the spirit. Or what does a believer have? The Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. So there are people who, who talk about the Bible, who talk about biblical things, but they don't have the Holy Spirit, which means they were never born again. But he reminds God's people that you are already warned. Everybody has warned you. You know, all the apostles. John spoke about it. Peter spoke about it. Uh, now I, Jude, I am talking to you about it. Paul wrote about it. So please be aware there are going to be such people, mockers. You know, there will be no use listening to their destructive teaching. It doesn't glorify God. But instead of that, what should the believers do? He says, you build yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So he's calling the believers to a place of strength. And he says, it's your responsibility. As long as you know you are here, you have to maintain your spiritual strength. So how are you going to do that? One key he gives here, he says, pray in the spirit. So pray in tongues, pray uh, by the Holy Spirit. Now we know uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it tells us that when somebody prays in tongues, what do they do? They edify themselves. So our spirit man is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. So spend a lot of time in the word, meditate on the word, pray and pray also in the Holy Spirit and that will keep us strong. Even when such things happen in the body of Christ, we will be able to pick it up quickly and uh, uh, you know be uh, safe from such teachings and then he says keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus unto eternal life and on some have compassion making a distinction but others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment defiled by the flesh so he talks about working with you know, some who have gone astray from God. So he says, there will be some with whom you can deal in a gentle way. But with some people, you may need to be strict. And uh, uh, like, it's helpful because even if you are strict, what are you going to do? You're going to pull them out of the fire or you're going to bring them back on track. Uh, and so uh, do this. You know, bring back those who have gone away from God and... Uh, uh, help them to continue following God. And towards the end, you know, he just gives um, a blessing to the people. And he says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. So again, you know, he's talking about an empowering God. Our God will protect us. He will help us stand till the end. So now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. So we know in Ephesians, we've seen all this. Why has God chosen us? He wants to present us blameless and spotless before the Father. And that is his heart for us. Uh, so before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So it's like a blessing and, um, you know, giving glory to God, giving glory to who? God is. So that is about uh, the book of uh, Jude here. Basically, it's one, only one chapter, but it is a warning uh, about apostate. Uh, 
people, leaders. They've gone away from God. You recognize them you know, by their grumbling, by their selfishness, uh, by their uh, empty words. Um, uh, and, and also there are certain attitudes we saw. We saw unbelief, arrogance. Um, then what else did we see? Uh, self being um, fleshly having fleshly lusts uh, and also rejecting authority not staying within our boundaries these are all attitudes that we have to be careful about uh, and if we see somebody wandering away from god you know it says okay come on you do your part to bring them back some people with compassion but some people with uh, strictness uh, but you know that way we are really helping and blessing the body of christ so uh, i hope uh, it's okay everyone You've understood, Jude? Any questions? Any thoughts? So it's very similar, no? Okay, no questions, Dave. Very similar to First Peter chapter 2 also, where Peter talks about uh, apostates. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to know that. Very clear. Great. Let's now just enter um, James, the book of James. And uh, James also is, is a fairly simple, very practical book. Uh, and I, I, you know, we should be able to complete it well in time. I will go on till your last class. Okay, I need till your last class. So uh, don't mind, but we, we will finish it at a comfortable speed. Now, coming to the epistle of James. So a little bit about James. I told us that Jude is a half-brother of Jesus. Similarly, James is also a half-brother of Jesus. Uh, and uh, about James, he too was an unbeliever, just like Jude. Um, but after the resurrection of Jesus, he started believing uh, in Jesus Christ. Then uh, we observe about... Um, what else can I say about... Uh, James. Okay. Another thing about James is that he became, see, Apostle James, there, is, there are two James uh, when we read about the life of Jesus. So there's an Apostle James uh, who is part of the 12. That James is killed. Do you remember? Uh, Herod put a sword to uh, him, his neck, and he was killed. And then Peter later on you know, peter later on he is uh he's spared but then peter sends word to james who is this james when one james is killed who is the other james who's there this other james is the brother of jesus who became a notable leader in the uh, acts of the apostles and we see that he was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. And even in Acts 15, the council, uh, you know, he has a very uh, major role to play there. He's the one who um, uh, declares that, that final decree about Gentiles not required to be circumcised and also he became a notable leader. Uh, we also recognize that uh, this book he wrote in uh, AD 45. So it is the earliest uh, epistle which was written. And he, being the leader of the church, he addresses certain issues that existed in the church. So when we go through the book of James, you'll see that you know, he's jumping from subject to subject. But his intention is to address you know, different matters within the church. Uh, and uh, in at some point, you know, he also, for um, the gathering of God's people, instead of the Greek word ecclesia, which is the understanding of the church, local church, he uses the word synagogue, which also tells us that the church was sort of emerging and evolving. And Pete, Paul, you know, their ministry, all that was going on, you know, simultaneously. So that correct picture of Christians and church, it was still emerging. So even James did not have that uh, understanding when he wrote the book of James. So these are all some facts about the book of James. And uh, James was martyred for the sake of Jesus. And one theme that runs through in uh, the book of James would be faith. Okay, Faith and faith in daily life. So if you want to summarize the book of uh, James, uh, you would say that James is Asking a believer uh, who says, I have faith, 
to live a life of faith. If you say you have faith, then please demonstrate that faith in the life that you live. So practical, very practical. Um, uh, and, you know, just uh, believer should be like a believer. That's the point that James has. So now let's go to the first chapter here uh, of the book of James. Now James introduces him, himself. He says, James, a born servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So a born servant of God, that is generally how an apostle introduced themselves. Okay, So um, born servant is also to show their commitment. Those days, a slave was called a born servant. So when somebody of their own free will says that I am a born servant of a person they are saying i am a slave i am i am sold out for the lord jesus christ so you notice how a brother is talking about his own brother he grew up with jesus why didn't he say james the brother you would be so proud to say that you know we had the same dad but James doesn't do that because he recognizes that Jesus was more than a man. He was God. And so humility, same with Jude. He says, Jude, a bond servant of the Lord Jesus. Humility, once you know, the more we know God, the normal response will be humility. We'll begin to understand, oh my goodness, this is the savior of the world. I must respect this person Jesus. So that attitude is coming forth in both Jude and James. Okay, And then he also says, you know, uh, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. So he addresses the Jewish Christians through the book, various parts of Jerusalem. Um, and uh, also, you know, the, they uh, say that he wrote it to those who were scattered um, outside uh, of Palestine, places like Mesopotamia and all that. So all, you know, different regions. And uh, he's basically addressing the believers there. One more thing I want to tell all of us is, you know, here uh, currently at APC, we are doing a study on uh, the book of James. In fact, it just got over. So all the notes are available on the website for, for us. So you can just download the notes and it uh, the um, whatever I'm sharing, there are many more details available for us in the notes. So that will also be helpful for you to understand. So the first topic which James touches is, he says, trials. Okay. When you go through trials, my brethren or people, Jewish believers, when you go through trials, he says, count it all joy. What is the joy that he's talking about. He's asking the people to rejoice or be cheerful, or have a calm, calm delight in various trials. Okay, trials are afflictions, difficulties, um, and uh, you know adversities that one goes through. So he says, when all these things happen, I want you to have a different response as compared to the world. What will people of the world do? They will grumble, they will uh, be sad, but you count it all joy. Why? Because he shows the nature of uh, trials to build us up. So in verse three, he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So he's saying that when our faith is tested, or when we go through trials, what happens? We have to hold on to God, right? So that holding on is not easy. It's like a test of our faith. What will it produce? Patience, okay? Patience is a, a part of our character. It is the ability to withstand in hope and know that you know, God will come through for us. And so he says, when we go through trials, you be happy because your character is being built up. And he also goes on to say in verse 4, that patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So he's saying that as long as we let patience develop within us, our character will be strengthened, that we may become 
perfect and complete nothing but mature we become more mature for the lord okay so that is what uh, uh, one should do when they are in difficulty or they are in uh, they are going through tribulations now one more uh, scripture i just want to refer to over here is romans 5 okay? romans 5 verses 3 and 4 because that passage it says that and not only that but we also glory in tribulations similar paul is saying something similar be happy when you're going through trials he says tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance what did james say it produces patience patience perseverance you know similar similar attributes and perseverance character and character hope so what he's saying is when we have gone through difficulty what is the end result yes patience it's doing its work in me but when somebody has gone through the test of their faith and developed patience they also have a sense of hope inside them okay it's not um going through difficulty thinking oh when is this uh, when is this building going to crash i'll wait till the building crashes hopelessness not with a hopeless attitude but in romans paul points out and he says that when we have endured when we are when we have perseverance it is going to produce character and character will produce hope so there will always be a sense of hope in somebody who knows how to go through tribulations, trials, difficulties. Uh, and so, you know, James is saying, you be happy. I know it's not easy, but it is going to be helpful. Uh, you will develop patience and patience will ultimately lead to hope. So now he is coming to the next subject here. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom. So in the trial situation what do we need when we are going through a tough time you know we need god's intervention and god intervenes by providing wisdom for that situation so he says if any of you lacks wisdom then you ask god who gives liberally to all so in this passage you know you must uh, be familiar with it it basically says let him ask uh, in faith with no doubting and he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the lord he is double minded man unstable in all his ways very simple what james is saying is in difficulty pray okay when we pray what happens? We are asking God for wisdom. And when we ask God for wisdom, he says, ask with faith. How should we pray? That is also told to us. In faith. Don't be double-minded. Double-minded is like saying, God may help me. God may not help me. I don't know, you know what is going to happen. Double-minded is to not be firm in making a decision. So, James points to that and says, if we are people of faith in a difficult time, we can ask God for wisdom and be confident that God will answer you. He talks about the characteristics of God and he says, you know, God who gives liberally. So, God is generous to provide his counsel to us and he says, God gives without reproach. That means, uh, you know, when we um, ask for something, maybe we would have asked our parents, give me more, you know, I want more, uh, I want more uh, notebooks, go buy more notebooks for me. Sometimes what hap uh, used to happen, parents would be like, what is this? You're troubling me. You're asking so again and again, you're asking me uh, the same things. How many notebooks should I give you? So they give us, but with a rebuke. That is with reproach. But he's telling us about the character of God and he's saying, see, God is so generous and happy. When we say, God, help me, give me wisdom, God will give wisdom and he's not going to scold you for it. Okay, So that is the way in which God will give wisdom so that you can go through your time of difficulty and uh, become stronger through it. Okay, So let me just stop here. I'll continue from here and let's hope, I'm hoping... 
to finish uh, till chapter uh, three uh, next uh, week. And then the last week, we'll do four and five. Okay, so let's close with a word of prayer. Okay, I see the comments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would request somebody to please pray so that we can wrap up today's class. Kiran, can you pray? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's pray. Father God, we come before once again your throne and we want to say thanking you, Father God, for all things, Father God. Thanking you for your grace, mercy, and your understanding, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for your revelation. Thanking you, Father God, to, uh, to the subject, Father God, that we are understanding and help us, Father God, to apply to our our life and kingdom work also, Father God, give that life manner, Father God, that we can understand every step, Father God, and help us to the journey, Father God. Submitting to rest, submitting to your hand, rest of the day, Father God, and all the student and ma'am also, Father God, take care of every side. Thanking you, Father God. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. And uh, yeah, take care. We'll uh, connect next uh, Monday. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Thomas.